Well, we started a new sermon series last week, and uh, a sermon series based out of some of the ideas. It's, of course, based out of the Bible, but based, um, the kids, yes, I'm sorry, kids, if you want to go, we do have some kids here today, if they want to go to the children's church with the Lane team, head on down. Um, they meet in the lower level. If you can't find them there, you'll find them in the gym following worship is where they tend to congregate as well. But we did start uh, the sermon series last week, and, and uh, the kernel idea for it came from a book by the name of Peacemaker. Uh, the author of that book is a man by the name of Ken Sandy. Ken is a uh, lawyer in Montana, a Christian lawyer, who specializes in uh, mediation and resolution of conflict. And um, he's been doing this for a lot of years now and is very good at his work. But uh, along the way, and I, I would say 20-ish years ago when he published this book, um, published this just gem of a book. And I'd never heard of him. I'd never heard of their Peacemakers Ministry or anything of that sort. Got to seminary, and it was assigned reading for one of my classes. And, and, and I remember looking at it thinking, this just, I, I'm not interested really. It's just not my thing. I'll do it begrudgingly because I have to because it's seminary. And um, when you're in seminary, that's how things work sometimes. You have to read an awful lot. If you've, never, you've never read until you were in a seminary class and read that assigned list of reading. I, I read more, I think, in one seminary class than multiple years of college. And that is not an exaggeration. That's the amount of reading that we had in some of those classes. So I, I finally got to this book in the order of reading and and I read it and was just floored, just astonished, just blown away with the simplicity, with the clarity, with just how spot on he was at pulling what were very biblical principles. He wasn't working with something that's extra biblical or unique or new, but he just had a way of bringing it together to making it abundantly clear. And so uh, the big ideas for the sermon series come directly out of that book. If you want to go deeper with it, if you want to use it in your professional life. Uh, they have systems for businesses and all kinds of things that you could utilize if you go to Peacemaker Ministries uh, to be more equipped on the subject. They can certainly do that for you. Well, last week we kicked off the first sermon, and, and the idea behind that very first sermon was about glorifying God in conflict. And the big idea was that despite what we might be going through in the moment, we can find ways to glorify God in that conflict. And as we do that, as we respond glorifying God, it, it will cause us to have a different kind of conflict than we might otherwise have. A different kind of conflict than what the world is expecting. And, and when we don't respond in the ways that the world expects us to respond, they begin to ask questions. Why, why did you forgive me? Why didn't you retaliate? Why, why did you respond this way. And our hope is that as we respond differently, as we love when we are not loved, as we forgive even if we've not been forgiven, as we seek reconciliation at times where it doesn't seem to make sense that we should be, that it will open up opportunities, it'll open up windows, it'll give us moments where, in those moments of clarity where the world sees that we are living differently, that they will see it ask that question and be genuinely open to our response that it's by the power of God through the Holy Spirit from Jesus Christ and it's because he loved me and it's because he forgave me when I didn't deserve it it's because because I'm messed up I'm a sinner living in a broken world but in spite of that I am blessed and forgiven that I can respond differently I choose to respond differently I choose to love when others would hate and as we do that we share the gospel simply by living our lives. And that is the most powerful testimony you could possibly give. And so the ideas behind this are very practical. They, they are things that hopefully as you hear these sermons, you can take and apply to your lives today, tomorrow, for the rest of your lives. If you miss a week, I would strongly, richly, deeply encourage you, go online. Watch the sermon or sermons that you missed. Um, I love it that you watch my sermons if you miss. But I think these are of such a high importance in our, our everyday world that they are worth seeking out and hearing and being reminded of these biblical principles of how we handle conflict, of how we get reconciled, of how we deal with these problems. Because each and every one of us, 
has been hurt, and each and every one of us has hurt someone else. And so, very, very, very much a practical series here. And you'll find those sermon videos on YouTube. I, I link to them on the, the Facebook page. If you don't have those, let me know. We'll find a way to get it to you. We do have the ability to burn DVDs. We don't tend to do that a whole lot, but in certain circumstances, if you wanted a DVD, we could do that. You could send it to family, send it to friends, whatever you might need. Well, we're going to be in Matthew today, the book of Matthew. Matthew is the first book in the New Testament. And Matthew 7, 3 through 5 are going to be the focus verses. And the key question that we are going to be looking at today is how can I show Jesus' work in me by taking responsibility for my contribution to this conflict? Because you see, conflict doesn't happen in a vacuum. Frequently. Whether or not we were the actual cause of the conflict, we have some responsibility for that conflict, right? And you know this if you're married. You may not have triggered that argument, but somewhere along the lines, you did something that led to this point, right? And that's the way it often works. It works at work, it works at school, it works at home. Conflict is never simply black and white and simple. It's off and on, and this is the only problem that we're arguing about. There's always underlying issues, right? And then when you get to the really big arguments all those issues start to come out, right? So you, so you have that, that argument, and it's about this. And then all of a sudden you realize, we're not actually arguing about this. We're arguing about this. We're just talking about this. You ever have those arguments? As men, that is completely confusing to us, ladies. I, just so you know. But we're learning, slowly, if we have to. Red, green, anyone? No, okay, never mind. Um, <laughs> we're going to read this passage of Matthew 7 through or Matthew 7, 3 through 5. And we're going to see, and, and you should know if you don't know, that Jesus had an awful lot to say about resolving conflict. And this passage in Matthew is going to be very familiar to you. I, I would be surprised if anybody in the room hasn't heard it before, but I'm going to read it for you nonetheless. Matthew 7, 3 through 5. And Jesus says, What do you look, or, or why do you look at the, the, the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye, but pay yet no attention to the plank that is in your own? How can you say to your brother, let me take that little speck out of your eye. When all the time there is a plank in your own eye. You hypocrite! First, take the plank out of your own eye. Then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Now sometimes this passage is interpreted as a, a warning for us against talking to others about their faults. But if you read it carefully you'll see that this isn't actually forbidding loving correction. Rather, what it does is it forbids premature and improper correction. Before you talk to others about their faults, Jesus wants you to face up to your own. Once you have dealt with your contribution to a conflict, you may then approach others about theirs. So it's very simple. First you, and then them. Now be honest, how many of you start conflicts that way? Right? That's why we're studying this. We have to learn to overlook minor offenses for this to be successful. An important step to getting the log out of our own eyes is simply learning to overlook minor offenses. You know, we all like to think that we are gracious people, right? And in some areas, that, that, that may and probably is true for many of us. But my guess is that many of you are a whole lot like me. Sorry. My guess is a lot of you are like me. And you have areas in your life where, to be truthful, you like me, we have problems being gracious, even at minor offenses, right? You got anything in your life that you just struggle being gracious in? I'll tell you mine, for being transparent. For me, it's being late, right? I hate being late. I hate being late, even if the thing I'm going to is not important to me. I hate being late. Even if I don't want to go there, I hate being late. Because I hate being late. 
I'm not always gracious when other people make me late. Because I feel like you don't value my time like I value my time, right? And believe me, I can make a pretty strong case for why you don't respect or love me because you've made me late somewhere. Why are you being so selfish? Clearly, you don't care about my well-being. You know I don't like being late. Now for you, maybe it's getting cut off in traffic, right? Or whatever it is. We all have those little things that we should be able to overlook and we should be able to be gracious about. Maybe those people who don't use blinkers drive you nuts. Or maybe it's those people who just leave their blinkers on for miles. In Florida, that's called an eventual turn. You've driven in Florida, you know what I mean. Or maybe you're just angry at your spouse for something trivial, right? They left the toilet seat up or... I don't know. They they lost the remote control or they didn't put the dirty dishes in the sink again, right? What is it that triggers you? What triggers these unnecessary and often unfair conflicts in your life? See, we often hide these things under what we call pet peeves, right? Am I preaching? Are you getting a little uncomfortable yet? Anybody got pet peeves? We, we, we call them pet peeves because in our minds that justifies our behavior, right? What are the minor offenses in your life that you need to learn to overlook so that you can grow? Learning to overlook the minor offenses actually helps you grow in your faith walk. Now, when we overlook these, these minor things, these wrongs of others, we're actually imitating God's extraordinary forgiveness towards us. Psalm 103 says, The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will He harbor His anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve, nor does He repay us according to our iniquities. Since God doesn't deal harshly with us when we sin, we should be willing to treat others in similar fashion. Now that doesn't mean we have to overlook all sins. That's not what I'm saying. But it does require that we ask God to help us discern what we do need to be overlooking. These minor wrongs, these slights, these little offenses in our lives that aren't really worth taking up and going to battle over. And overlooking offenses is appropriate under... Two conditions. The first is, that offense should not have created a wall between you and the other person or caused you to feel differently towards him or her for a short period of time. And the second is, that offense should not be the type of offense that's causing serious harm to God's reputation, to others, or to the offender. You see, overlooking isn't a passive process. You need some discernment. And overlooking isn't simply just remaining silent for the moment and just filing that offense away for later use against somebody. It's not that either. Instead, overlooking is an active process that is inspired by God's mercy through the gospel. It means that we are going to deliberately decide not to talk about it, not to dwell on it, not to let it grow, not to pent it up inside of ourselves and let it become bitterness. If you, if you can't let go of an offense in this way, or if it's too serious to overlook, or if it continues on as, as part of a pattern in that person's life, it's then that we need to go and talk with that person. It's then that we go and take it to the next step in a loving and constructive manner. And we'll be talking about that more in the weeks to come. If you're taking notes, the second thing is we have to count the costs. Remember, we've got to get that log out of our eye before we can go and get the speck out of the other. Another way to get that log out of our eyes to, to avoid unnecessary conflict is we need to consider the cost of the unresolved conflict. 
Here's something I have learned. Conflict is often much more expensive than we would have expected it to be. Right? How many conflicts have you had? On the back side of it, you went, oh, that escalated, ex escalated quickly, right? Didn't expect it to go that direction. That got a little out of hand. That happens. Unresolved disputes can consume large amounts of time, energy, money, leaving us emotionally, spiritually drained. And worst of all, as long as there's disagreement, as long as there's this unresolved thing, there's potential for further damage to that relationship. In Matthew 5, Jesus tells his disciples, tells his followers to, to settle disputes with others as quickly as possible. Don't drag them out. Don't always carry around this baggage of unresolved conflict. That's called carrying a grudge. Ongoing hostility can destroy you from the inside, and it also alienates you from God. And then on top of that, the anxiety, the, the negative thinking generated by conflict has a habit of kind of squirting out sideways and harming oftentimes innocent people. You ever had that happen? I, I bet you have. Where, where you had a, a bad day at work and you came home and your kid did something and you unloaded. And they spilled the milk. And all of a sudden you find yourself yelling at them over spilled milk. Or maybe you took it out on your spouse. Or, or maybe you had an argument before work that morning with your wife and you, you got to the office and all of a sudden you snap at somebody. And they're like, whoa, where did that come from? Right? We've all been on probably the giving and receiving end of that sort of behavior. When, we, when we're angry and we don't deal with it, it squirts out. It's trying to find an, out, find an outlet, a valve, a place to go. And unfortunately, it can hit and harm those who are completely innocent. Let me tell you about uh, the freeing experience that I had when I first experienced the process of, of counting the costs of carrying a grudge. My first college roommate was a, was a man, we'll call him Jason. Jason and I were roommates for our first two years of school. And, and sadly, we didn't talk, literally, the last two years of college. We started out as the odd couple in college, right? He and I were opposites in every end of things. The only thing that we had in common was we were at a Baptist college and we both grew up Lutheran. That's it. Well, I guess we were both guys. Outside of us both being freshmen and having grown up Lutheran, we had nothing in common. And the first three months or so, we basically just tolerated each other. But then eventually, by Christmas time, we had become friends. And then over the next year, we became quite close, honestly, to the point at which we had shared things with each other we had never told anybody else in life. We would bonded. Now, he was part of a group of guys who, who had influenced me. They were directly responsible for my coming to faith. And he and I went together on my very first missions trip. I became a Christian in January. In March, I was in Mexico giving him my testimony. That's crazy. That's the way God works. But unfortunately, around Christmas time of our second year of living together, things began to change. Well, I'm not going to go into all the details today of why it happened. You should know by that spring of that year, we were basically avoiding each other. It wasn't uncommon that one of us would actually sleep in another one of our friends' rooms, so we didn't spend the night in the same place. Things were said. Things were done. Shallow petty things. Things that I'm sure neither of us were proud of. Hurtful things. Why did it get to this point? Because neither one of us had counted the costs. And neither one of us were willing to back down. It cost me my best friend. 
I was angry. I was bitter. And I carried that with me for a very long time. Even years after we had graduated, we lived in different states. I still harbored anger towards him. And I drug it along behind as part of the baggage of my life. If you haven't learned this yet, you you should know that the more baggage that you are dragging behind you, the harder it is for you to move forward in life. And boy, did I drag that baggage. Years after my conflict, while I was still carrying around this baggage, I finally learned about this idea of counting the costs. When I stopped, when I looked at it, I saw that for years this had been gnawing at me. Because he would still occasionally pop up in my life. He's still friends with my friends. His wife is friends with a bunch of my other friends. I see their, their posts on Facebook and their family, and I see all those kinds of things in life. And for years it just kind of ate away at me. And it had been influencing my other relationships in my life and not in good and positive ways. And so, when I learned about this, I resolved to move past it, to grow beyond it, to no longer let it hold me back, to no longer drag that baggage with me everywhere I was going. I sat down after having read this book and wrote a letter, handwritten, Sounds crazy, you know, some people still write occasionally. Handwritten letter I wrote to him, writing this out, just apologizing for my part. Just saying, I, buddy, I was an idiot and didn't treat you like I should have, and I wasn't living very Christ like ways. Asking him forgiveness, explaining why I was wrong. I mailed it off to him. Now, I wish I could tell you that everything's great now. I, I, wish, I wish I could tell you that we made up and we get together on holidays and have barbecue together. I, I do really wish that was true. But it isn't. Not all stories have happy endings. My roommate, at least thus far, hasn't acknowledged me in any sort of returning way. In my, my effort to be reconciled with him, he's not responded to it. And that started 15 years ago. But even though I haven't been reconciled, I have been set free. You see, I no longer carry that burden of anger. I no longer have that bitterness. I no longer have what some might have even called a hatred towards him. And truthfully, I tell you this, it was one of the most liberating things of my life when I finally set this conflict free. That sounds good, doesn't it? Does anybody else want to be set free? Does anyone here need to count the cost of these conflicts in your life? Is there anyone else here today that that, that needs to learn to look past the little offenses? See, in this thing that we had, Jason and I, there's no big thing that triggered it. It was all those little things of living with somebody. Stupid things. Things you should move past. Do you want to be free? Here's the good news. Through Jesus' work in you, you can take responsibility. You can make the necessary changes. You can move forward, leaving that baggage behind. For some of you, it's going to be hard. You've carried a grudge for many years, right? And it's become part of who you are. Here's what I know. Carrying a grudge is not God-honoring. If you want to find freedom from these things that are weighing you down, that are holding you back, you need to work with God to change your attitudes, and your behaviors. Know today that that God is eager to help us grow and to change. There is no sin, there is no habit in your life that cannot be overcome by God's grace. God promises that if you have Jesus in your life, that He will work through you so that you can learn to replace your old sinful behavior 
with new godly attitudes and habits. So to that end, I'm going to close today with three ways that God has given us that we might be set free. First way is super simple. We must pray. Thank God for the the saving work that He's already done in your life and ask Him to give you the faith to believe that you can really change. Pray that He will open your eyes to see what He wants you to do to grow and ask Him to give you the strength on a daily basis to put off your old ways of thinking that have been dragging you down. Ask God to set you free and to teach you to forgive as He forgave you. The second thing He's given us is we need to study. Through the process of spending time in God's Word, we will be transformed. God's Word has power. What we put into ourselves impacts what comes from us. If we aren't taking and putting God's Word into ourselves, we cannot expect to react and grow in godly ways. God does not just mysteriously infuse our minds with the things that we're going to need in order to be able to do these kinds of forgivenesses. He's not just magically going to put it in us so that we can move on. Those things come from regular and careful time spent with God and the Word. And then the final thing is this. We must practice. We must put into practice the things that we are learning. It does us no good if you come to Sunday, you listen to the sermon, you read your Bible, you say your prayers, but then you never get around to forgiving that person. You never get around to seeking reconciliation. You never... Take the steps necessary for resolution and reconciliation. We must commit ourselves to be peacemakers. We need to take that first step. Jesus was just talking about it, remember? We need to take that first step to break free from the bondage of our past conflicts. With with God's help, with faithful practice, we can develop a Christ-like character. To be a peacemaker, you need to deal honestly with your contribution to the conflicts. You need to get the log out of your own eye, right? You need to get the log out of your eye before you can work on somebody else's speck. And when God moves one person to get the log out of his or her own eye, it's amazing how frequently he works to do the same in the other person. As I told you, it's not always going to be the case. That hasn't happened yet for me. I keep praying that someday I'll be reconciled with this guy who used to be my roommate because he is a neat guy. But all I can do is take care of my side of that equation. I can only work on my part. And then be set free. So as I close in prayer, I want you to think about someone you've had unresolved conflict with. I suspect as I've been preaching, maybe even today, that that name or multiple names have already probably popped into your head. I want you to think about the cost of that conflict, of that baggage you've been dragging. How is it impacting you? Is it worth it? This week I want you to start working towards reconciliation and just pick one relationship. I want you to commit to taking the first step. Begin to free yourself from the baggage. It doesn't matter if you've been hurt. You can take care and control that situation. Or the alternative is you can let it be an anchor in your life, dragging you down holding you back, keeping you from experiencing the full freedom that's found in Christ. So which will it be? Will you work towards freedom? Will you take that first step? Pray with me. God, today, as we, each and every one of us all, bow our heads in prayer, I suspect you've placed in many, if not most, if not all of our hearts, 
someone. God, none of us is free from conflict, not even myself. And God, we want to to grow as individuals and as a church. And I pray, Lord, that you would burden us to be peacemakers. God, guide us. Guide us through the reconciliation process. Guide us, Lord, to restoration. Lord, where restoration cannot come, I pray that we would still find freedom nonetheless. Father, may we be gracious as you have been gracious to us. Burden us this week, Lord, that we may take the first steps to be set free from our past conflict. Change us, O God, that we might learn to deal with conflict in healthy and Christ-honoring ways. And now with our heads down as we pray, I would challenge you to pray for that person right now that you have had conflict with. You can pray for more than one person, but pray for at least one person. We all have conflicts. Pray that God will change that relationship. Pray that God would change you where you need to be changed. Pray that that God will clearly show you what the first step this week should be. Pray that God would indeed, truly set you free. Yes, God, free us. That is our prayer. God, show us the way to find freedom in Christ, to be released from the baggage of past hurts and past harms. Father God, show us to be reconciled. Teach us your ways. As you have forgiven, as you have shown us grace, may we forgive and be gracious. And God, as we do that, we bring you all glory, honor, and praise. We thank you for your love and for your Son, Jesus Christ. And it is in his name we pray today. Amen. If you need prayer today, maybe you need prayer over a person you've had conflict with, and you want to come clean, and you just want to... Take that next step. We will have some folks up here you can stop and pray with. Otherwise, you are free to go and go forth seeking reconciliation. Because as you are reconciled, you will change the world. Amen.